This is Jay McInerney. Jim Harrison was a prolific American poet, novelist, and essayist who published, by my count, at least 39 books before he passed away on March 26, 2016. He's perhaps best known for his 1979 novella, Legends of the Fall, which was later made into a movie starring Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins. Recently, I sat down with Jim's friend, chef Mario Batali, to discuss, among other things, some of Jim's extreme behavior. So Mario, I remember first reading Jim I guess it was 77. I had just graduated from college. I was struggling to be a writer, and there was this amazing um, story in Esquire, actually a series of novellas, uh, called Legends of the Fall. You know, it was so muscular and powerful, and, but at the same time, it was something really new and original. What, what, what was your first encounter with um, Jim Harrison's writing? You know, I had read Dalva, but didn't really put the Jim Harrison moniker on it. I mean, I knew yeah. what it was, but when I really got a hold of him was when I read The Road Home. I met him after I read the book, but I had known about him and his legendary status. And so he came to Babo. Uh, right after it opened, yeah? Right after it opened, and I wasn't there, and I was a fan. I mean, I wanted to have been there. Um, and they just left a book, and I said, who left this book? Who left this book for me? <laughs> what, Jim Harrison was here? Yeah, some guy was in last night. He was a little loud. He was in the corner. His agent, or I think Judy Hodson, lent me the book. And I'm like, we have to find him. Give me some information. <laughs> they put us together. We wrote some handwritten letters together, and then he came back to town the next year. And we had like a 12-course, 12 12-wine... 12 dinner as you would with Jim Harrison. Yeah. And we became fast friends immediately and loved each other ever since. But you, but you, but you knew already that he was a foodie and a... Oh, yeah, I'd read a lot of his essays. Gourmand and... The uh, food essays, I think he did them for Esquire as well. Yeah. And they were fascinating. And his, I, I think, for me, Jim captured appetite in a way that almost no one else could. So tell me about that first encounter. That was on table 35 at Babo, which is the one <laughs> under the window when you come into the right-hand side. I mean, I really thought about it. You know, I'd read all of his favorite likes and dislikes. There was not going to be any chicken breast on this menu. There wasn't going to be, you know. <laughs> no I mean, skinless. Was, right, no boneless, skinless, whatever. <laughs> so you guys hit it off immediately. Immediately. So you cooked for him the first time. When was the first time he cooked for you? And what did he cook? Um, I remember it was at his house um, outside of Sutton's Bay out by Leland. And he had uh, a smoked leg of lamb. You'd never really see him hustle. But at one point, he had heard that someone had put the lid all the way down on the barbecue on this leg of lamb, and he sprinted outside to make sure there was enough air there that it wouldn't overcook it. And in fact, it was absolutely delicious. And then I think for dessert, he made a tart to tan. If so, I so he was a good cook? Oh, excellent cook. I mean, we, know, we know he was a great eater. Yes. Um... No, and I mean, I think Jim's a great cook, provided he's given two assistants at all times. <laughs> I think this is one of the amazing things about Jim and his writing was, was, was his unashamed uh, celebration of, of his cravings and the massiveness of his appetite. I think it might have been his 70th birthday and I surprised him. I think 14 courses, probably 10 wines. You know, Jim was infinite and always hungry and always thirsty. And it was with no apologies. It wasn't like, oh, let's just... He was more like, it was your moral obligation to consume a little more, because you could. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a terribly unfashionable um, sentiment now, although it seems to have made him very popular and beloved. Right, uh, you exactly. Know? I mean, well, we all I, love I someone who can. I would go out to his house in either Patagonia or Livingston, and we would hunt for two or three days in a row. And just walking the fields with him and hearing the noises and having him interrupt them a little bit, but also his his calm quietness when we were heading toward a dog that was on a point was just something remarkable and beautiful about him. And, and just looking at him with his Elmer Fudd clothes on is something that brings a laugh, <laughs> a laugh to my heart every time I think about him. Well, we once went fishing in the Yellowstone River, which was behind, kind of out behind his house. And I remember we cast for about a half hour, we didn't catch a thing, and then he caught two, you know, nice-sized cutthroats. And out of nowhere, I caught like a four-pound brown trout. And it was just like, see, I bring good luck, don't I? I'm like, yes, you do, man. We're in your boat. He looked at that fish for three or four minutes before we finally released it. And he was just like, this is one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. And I mean, a four-pound fish was pretty big. It was, it was impressive. So how do you think Jim is going to be remembered as a man of... Of appetites, a man of craving, a man of letters, uh, all of I the think above. It'll, all of the above, but I think above all he'll be remembered because everyone forgets the 
Bacchanalian fest eventually. They'll remember the menus, but I think his writing will stand up for a long, long time because it is such a unique and beautiful voice. And his, his poetry, even in regular prose, was something so mimicable and yet so hard to grab a hold of. It was just, it's tasty and, and it's, I'm rereading all of his work right now just because there's a time to do it. Is, is it possible is it, that there's a most memorable moment with a guy who is as memorable as Jim Harrison? He was at Del Posto right when it opened and that was right when people couldn't smoke anymore. And we're looking at him, we're like, Jim, you're smoking. <laughs> He's got a menu in front of him. No, I'm not. I'm not smoking. I'm like, Jim, everyone in the whole restaurant knows you're smoking. Could you put that up? Mary, I'm not smoking. I was, Dude, what are you doing? You're crazy. Yeah. So how do you how do you commemorate a man like Jim Harrison? Do you think there's uh, oh, that's tough. just in memory or? We'll try to drink to excess on his birthdays. We'll try to, <laughs> we'll try to eat lardo when we can on the day of his death. and. Try to find something that we can do that brings us a little bit closer to our memory of him. I don't imagine it will fade very quickly. Either. Yeah, I know I'll miss him. Exactly. Well, thanks, Mario. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.